her New York Times best-selling book, How to Raise an Adult, Break Free of the Over-Parenting Trap to Prepare Your Kids for Success, for our weekly administrative team book club. Each chapter generated animated discussions and debates, and soon our weekly book club gatherings morphed into free therapy sessions as we confessed our over-parenting sins and reflected on her deep insight, straightforward advice, and practical wisdom. Julie's story and her own vulnerability spoke to each of us, not only as professional educators, but on a deeper and more personal level as parents. How to raise an adult, break free, from the over-parenting trap and prepare your kids for success, emerged from a decade of research as Stanford University's Dean of Freshmen, where Julie was known for her fierce advocacy for young adults and profound critique of the growing trend of parental involvement in the day-to-day -day lives of college students. Julie draws on her own insights as both a mother and a dean of students to highlight the ways in which over-parenting harms children, their stressed out parents, and society at large. While emphasizing the parental hopes and fears that lead to overparenting, Julie challenges each of us to examine our own behaviors and allow our children to develop their own resourcefulness, resilience, and inner determination necessary for success. We are thrilled tonight to have the opportunity to listen to Ms. Julie Lithcott King. Go to any book. 
Um, yeah, most of you here tonight are strangers to me, but there are two very wonderful people in the audience who are making me feel um, that I'm not quite 3,000 miles from home. These are my cousins, Lori and Leon Lonzak, who live about 40, no, about an hour away, but um, they're here tonight. Will you just raise your hands, Lori and Leon? They're right here in the middle. They're technically my husband's cousins, technically my husband's first cousin once removed, but in our hearts, we are family. And now you all have to clap extra loud at the end, talk about how family is, okay? <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So welcome to the lecture on how to bribe people to get your kid into college. <laughs> that is not actually the point of my lecture. It might be happening down the road somewhere, but I'm glad that you're here at this conversation instead. And I just want to get this out of the way. Um, the Robbinsville Senior Leadership didn't invite me to be here with you all because they worry that any of you are helicopter parents. <laughs> but rather, tonight we're going to talk about what other people are doing wrong. <laughs> so that you can go out into the community and tell, and you know, with your networks and your influence, you can tell other people how to be better parents. How does that sound? Are you with me? All right. Okay. If you ask a teenager what it feels like to be a kid in a community like yours or mine or many others today, and if you really have the guts to listen, they'll tell you that they feel a lot of pressure and stress. They'll tell you that we can spend all the money in the world on the mental health issues, more counselors, more beds, more facilities, more resources, but until we also address why so many of our kids need these resources in the first place. Well, we're not really addressing the problem. Rigor and wellness have to be possible, have to coexist. We don't want rigor if it undermines student wellness, right? I think the best way to get at this truth that I've come to accept the long and hard way is to share some of my stories with you as parents which I'll do in about five or six minutes after I know you better. <laughs> I'll start by telling you briefly about what I saw as a dean of freshman at Stanford University that made me want to write a book called How to Raise an Adult. Working with other people's sons and daughters and students made me get a glimpse of the future. 18 to 22 year olds, I saw those who were self-reliant and autonomous and accountable and those who were heavily reliant upon parents to do with everything for them, and I wanted my kids to be like this, not like this. And I feel like I saw the future in other people's kids, and I ran back to the present to write a book to warn those of us still raising kids. There's a cliff up ahead. We have to go another way. Here's what I was seeing. I had 1,700 students every year. I've seen a freshman from 2002 to 2012. What I saw was not a Stanford thing. I was seeing as a college administrator what administrators were seeing on campuses across the United States in every tier, okay, public, private. This is a Stanford thing I'm about to describe. It's an American thing, and even beyond America, actually. I was seeing parents coming to college with their kids and staying, okay? All right, so being overprotective, fiercely directive, and acting like the concierge at the college level. So the overprotective parent from childhood who has to bubble wrap every surface, right, bike helmet on in the driveway, right, the overprotective parent at college is calling me, Julie, I'm worried about my daughter. I haven't heard from her in a day, and uh, I just want to be sure she's okay, and I say, sir, I'm sure she's fine, but we can do a, well. please don't tell her I called you, sir, I'm sure she's fine, we can do a welfare check in the dorm, oh, I know she's in the dorm, I can, <laughs> I can see that, but she hasn't returned my 90 phone call, and I'm thinking, gee, I wonder why not. <laughs> The fiercely directive parent showing up saying, you will major in pre-med. You will major in economics. The fiercely directive, a.k.a. tiger type, not limited to Chinese Americans or Indian Americans or Nigerian Americans or whoever you think it's limited to. The tiger type of parenting is acceptable to anyone regardless of ethnicity. This is the parent who says, I know best what leads to success, kid, and you will do as I say. 
right? The tiger type or the over-directive type never says, you got to major in art history, right? You don't come home for Thanksgiving if you aren't a philosophy major, right? They never say that in law, phys, med, stem, you get it, right? Or tennis star, concert pianist, right? So I knew so many pre-meds biding their time to tell their parents I don't want to be a doctor. And sadly, they told me they thought that time would come only when they were a doctor, when with the authority of the stethoscope and the white coat on their shoulders, they could finally stand up to their parents and say, I'm not going to do this anymore. And then the third type, overprotection, fierce direction, the third type is the concierge. The parent who approaches parenting as, and I do that because we used to call it child rearing, putting the child at the center of the endeavor to be raised to adulthood, now we call it parenting. That's sort of the tweet version of my talk tonight. I'm going to talk for like an hour, but if you have to leave, you know, soon, the tweet version is we put ourselves at the center of it. We're parenting instead of focusing on the child we're supposed to be rearing to adulthood, all right? So the concierge parent approaches parenting as, how can I make your childhood more pleasant, honey? Okay? And at college, the concierge is wanting to register their kid for class. You know, emailing me, I need my son's password. I'm sorry, I can't give third parties a password. Oh, I'm not a third party. I'm his mom. <laughs> you know, and it's so complicated. And I've always done it for him. I love being helpful. Well, man, we expect a college student who could really be in the Army, but it's instead at Stanford to be able to register themselves for college courses, okay? Or um, my daughter's been admitted to study abroad with you in Berlin next quarter. We are so excited that we are going abroad. And when is your parent orientation session for study abroad? Oh my. I'm a member of Gen X. Raise your hand if you're a boomer or Gen X. Raise, and don't worry, I'm not going to pick on you, so be proud, okay? When we went abroad, I mean to another country when we were 20, often we were abroad before our parents knew we were gone. But nowadays it is customary for parents to say, well, we need an info session with supplies and a speaker so we can keep track of the deadlines and the expectations so we can be successful abroad. Concierge parents are even going so far as to install a webcam into the dorm room. Who would want to review that? <laughs> but not for any untoward reason. I assure you, this story is actually from the University of Miami, which is not to say it's not happening everywhere. The webcam was there for the purpose of being able to wake the kid up. Some of you were like, oh, those parents, right? Let me tell you, if you've got a senior right now and you're waking them up, how are you going to stop next fall? In fact, you're going to say, I'm paying all the money, you're in college now, I need to make sure you're getting up, I need to make sure you know how to get yourself up, right? Doing with your 18-year-old what you really were supposed to do with your 8-year-old. All right. So these concierge just showing up and trying to do the stuff, frankly, we just thought college students ought to be able to do and historically had been able to do. No longer. So I, as a dean of freshmen, my job is to care about the students. You know, who are you, kid? What do you know to be true about yourself so far? What are you good at? What do you love? What do you think you might want to make of this one precious life? And my interest was in the young person in front of me, not what their parents wanted or needed, not what their whole extended family needed, not what their whole ethnic community thought was legit. My job was to care about the students. And over the years, I grew concerned that they were being forced down a path, some of them, by someone else. They were being forced down a path that their parents making. The tiger parents, love is conditioned upon how well the child executes is the parent's plans for the child. If they were being concierge, I wondered, when are you going to hunger for your own independence, kids? When are you going to shake off all this help and say, I got this, I can do this? And so I worried for my students' sake. And the overprotective students were anxious and worried and just didn't feel like um, they could really do anything, interact with the world without kind of having the safety net, the world's longest umbilical cord, as people have called it. Uh, without having that constant attachment to home. So when I had a podium at my university at orientation on move-in day, I would give a speech to parents. 
This was the evening. Movement had happened. We had a couple info sessions around safety and financial aid and other subjects for parents, and then it was dinner. And the students would be eating with their roommates for the first time, and we'd corral all the parents over to the gym, far away from the students, and we would have lovely meals set out for them. And the best a cappella group would go table to table singing a song about letting go. <laughs> and there was one exit from the gym that led directly to the parking lot. And the, the big speech was given by the provost, the number two at the university, and I was the warm-up act. And I would say this. Trust your son or daughter. They have what it takes to thrive here. They've earned this. Trust us, number two. We're not trying to get away with doing as little as possible here at Stanford University. Trust your kids. Trust us. Now please leave was my third message. And I've never actually wagged my finger at parents, but inside I was thinking, come on, folks. This isn't middle school. Go away. And then one day I made the mortifying discovery that I was on track to becoming one of those parents who wouldn't be able to let go of my 18-year-old one day. And now that I know you better, I'm going to segue to telling you some of my stories as a parent. So I've got Sawyer, who's my 19-year-old son, sophomore in college, Avery, my 17-year-old daughter, senior in high school. And when I was having Sawyer, I had a C-section. So I was in the hospital for five days. And they're finally releasing us. And so they wheel me out to the car. My husband Dan is holding Sawyer. And Sawyer, I mean, Dan takes Sawyer to the car and gently puts him in the infant car seat for the first time. Remember, the first time you had an infant in the car seat back in 1999, it was a five-point harness. I'm sure today it's an 11-point harness, just watching how things have progressed. And so Dan gets Sawyer in the car seat. Meanwhile, I'm gingerly carrying my staples together, C-section self, from the wheelchair into the car, trying to sit and strap myself in the back next to my baby. My husband gets in the front seat, buckles himself in, eases the car out of the parking lot onto the small highway, which becomes, onto the small road, which becomes a bigger road, which becomes the highway, and we're headed due north to our house, north of Palo Alto. I, I, uh, I've given birth at Stanford Hospital because I thought it couldn't hurt. And um, so we drive north to San Carlos. It should be 25 minutes, but it's about 35 minutes because my husband's going so slowly on the road, his infant on board, and we drive into the driveway of our home, and my husband turns off the car, unbuckles his seatbelt, and begins to open the door. And I say, honey, actually, um, before you come and get Sawyer, could you just uh, act, go in the house and you see, there was a nursery school I wanted my kids to get into. It's Stanford's nursery school. And if you know anything, when you live in my town, and I bet the same is true here, uh, you know, am I wrong? Is there a nursery school here? The matter? <laughs> so in my town, it's called Big Nursery School. It's Stanford's laboratory for faculty who study infant and early childhood development. Okay? They call it a nursery school, but it's really a lab. They could give the kids games that are really experiments, that are going to end up in a journal one day, like the marshmallow test. If you've read about this, that was done in Maine. So I knew I wanted my child to get his rightful start in life at big nursery school. And I had the application for two years, but Maine doesn't let you apply when your kid is just in your mind. So I said, man, honey, go into the house, get the form, that stack of papers on my desk, way down in the stack, is an application of being nursery school. I had filled it all out, but they required the name and a birthday, which we now had. I said, honey, fill in that info. We need to get back in the car, drive all the way back down to Palo Alto to y'all. Come on. He was already five days old. <laughs> I didn't want to ruin my kid's future by waiting until Monday. So uh, Sawyer got into the big. Thank you. Thank you very much. Avery, my daughter, got it two years later. And one day when Avery was four, it was my day for pickup. It was a Wednesday, my pickup. I had a busy full time job as a dean of freshmen, but a part, I mean, a flex schedule on Wednesday, which meant I was home around lunchtime with my kids, came back in around dinner time to the office and worked until 10 or 11 every Wednesday night. That was my deal. So this is a Wednesday, and I'm notorious.
notoriously late. Anyone here? Can you admit to that? Or are you the late parent? Let's face it, the late people probably haven't shown up yet. <laughs>
Um, he comes home from school, he reads over snacks, this is a reader. And um, my son has started taking books on play dates. Because you know, the play date doesn't work out. <laughs> and he can just read until it's time to be old. All right. And he gets diagnosed with ADHD and attentive type and dysgraphia in the fourth grade. But he's bright and curious, and these things don't seem to be really slowing him down. So now I'm back at Stanford, Sawyer's 10 Avery speech. I'm giving that speech to the Stanford parents of new freshmen for the seventh year in a row. Remember the speech? Trust your kid, trust us, now please leave. I come home the next night for dinner, we're having chicken, I sit next to Sawyer, and I lean over his plate and begin cutting his meat. And too many of you are thinking, so? <laughs> I can tell by how inaudible your reaction was. You should be laughing that I was cutting a 10-year-old's meat. But what I'm learning is, you're all cutting your kids' meat still. And some of you are wanting to pull out your phone surreptitiously to text your 11-year-old. You're going to cut your own meat tomorrow night. <laughs> Elective, but they have veto authority, and 
this summer they want me to do a medical clinical internship, something that will look good for my med school lab down the road, and I just don't think I want to do that this summer, and I was hoping for a bit of guidance about what else I might do, and I said, well, Faith, absolutely, what would you do if it was up to you this summer? How would you spend your time? She said, I think I'd like to work with abused animals. And I said, well, I'm sure you could do that work here in the Bay Area, maybe even back home where you live. Faith, what would it take for you to open that conversation with your folks? How can I help you think about planning for that conversation, not only to happen, but to go your way? And at this point, her eyes filled with tears. And this young woman happened to be a soccer player who was stunning looking. She had dressed up for this office hour, so she was sort of in a suit. So she was sort of a picture of success and achievement. And her eyes filled with tears when I asked, how, are, how might you start this conversation with mom and dad? So I softened my demeanor, my language, my tone, and I leaned forward, and I said, Faith, looking at her, trying not to let those tears fill, I said, Faith, how are you? She said, I have a 4.0. <laughs> Do you think that's what I was asking the student? Do you? No. I was asking, are you okay? I was trying to signal, in fact, I am concerned. I was trying to signal, I care about you. But by this point, as a 20-year-old sophomore at a highly selective university, Faith was accustomed to knowing how she was doing as a function of her GPA. I've got a 4.0 equals I'm great. So, I put on my Carol Dweck growth mindset hat and said, Faith, you must be working very hard. Most people don't have a 4.0 here, let alone in the pre-med curriculum. You're obviously working very hard. You must feel proud of yourself, and rightly so, kid. And she shrugged her shoulders again and said, I just hope that as long as I do as they say, well, then maybe they'll go a bit easier on my younger siblings. And that Friday afternoon in February of whatever year it was, working with the daughter of other people, I realized I was quite likely looking at a grown-up version of my baby girl, Avery. I realized that Avery one day would be on a campus, maybe mine, and um, an advisor would say to her when she asked, what should I do with you? my major, what should I do for the summer, what am I doing with my life? They would ask her the good questions I asked on any campus. They would ask good questions, and when they said, hey kid, what are you good at? What do you love? What do you want to make of your one precious life? I realized that day that my precious child would say, well, I was, I was good at art but my parents wouldn't take it seriously. And I think I began being a better parent to my sweet child that day. Well, Sawyer started high school at Henry M. Gunn at age 14, right down the road, the right school, taking all the right classes, doing incredibly well, intellectually curious, a teacher's dream. At the start of freshman year, fall semester and spring semester, at the start of sophomore year when he's in a new science class, and the teacher asks a tough question, Sawyer's hand shoots up, and every other kid, he tells me these stories, every other kid turns and looks at Sawyer, and the teacher who doesn't yet know Sawyer because it's a new class says, why is everyone turning and looking at this kid? And one of the kids will say, because Sawyer knows the answer. He's known among his peers as being the go-to guy particular for science, and the ADHD is still there, but not holding him back. He is selling. My son is headed to the right future, maybe even this college I work at, and he went to nursery school at, and I gave birth to him at, and, and I attended, and I met his dad at, you know, just maybe. And he still reads constantly. And in fact, in Northern California weather, my son often wears cargo shorts to high school. Those are the shorts with this kind of double pockets on each leg. And he's stuffing a paperback book into the pocket of his shorts. And I'm sitting there wondering, when is my son going to realize the girl
girls he's attracted to are not attracted to boys with books in their pants. <laughs> and then he finds a girl who is. And they read together under trees. And this is uh, like whatever else they're doing. And sophomore year, he's now 15. And he's about, so they start in late August, mid August, and it's now mid October. Doing well, he's in all the right classes, Spanish three honors chem, said to be the hardest class at his high school, not an AP, just a genius, crazy chemist who's happening to teach honors chemistry. Uh, uh, algebra two trig back plane designed to lead to the right calculus, designed to lead to the intergalactic math in college. <laughs> The right fancy history class, the fancy English class, a couple other classes, you get the point. Rigor, he's doing well, two months in, it's great, and I'm starting to notice that the homework load is five hours a night. Sophomore year. How does that sound, Robinville, and related communities? Is that high, normal, or low? Pop. Thank you. I thought it was possible. I mean, it wasn't junior year. Let's face it, we're all complicit in the junior year being hell. We've decided that's okay. Why? Because the colleges want to see it. The colleges want to see our kids suffer. The colleges want to see our kids not go sleep because they're doing so many APs and other things, right? But this wasn't that year. This was just all of sophomore year, five hours. And the ADD is definitely starting to impact him. The homework is taking longer, perhaps, than it should. We are sitting there with him to make sure we're redirecting his attention as it wanders out the window or to his fingernails. Like, come on, Sawyer, get this homework done. He's coming home. He does no sports, I forgot to say. No activities, no leadership, no community service. So this kid reads, have I mentioned, and does his work and has good friends and is a good boy. And he comes home at snack, you know, and he's doing a snack, he's reading. And so it's like snack, long drawn out snack, and then homework, 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 dinner, that family dinner we know we're supposed to have, right? Which we love. And then more homework after dinner. And he's been going to bed at like 11.30 or 12 every night. And uh, I'm starting to get worried just because of sleep. Like, my kid needs more sleep than this. This isn't okay if it's not yet junior year. So in the first week of this, every single day, it doesn't let up. The first weekend, we sit down with him, honey, let's help you sort this out. Time management clearly needs to work. We try to teach him some better techniques and also talk with him about how he can ask his teachers questions about how to kind of take this jigsaw puzzle, this sort of Jenga Tetris puzzle of homework and spit it together better. We think it's a problem to be solved, not a systemic problem with too much work. And so into the second week, this goes, and the homework doesn't let up. And into the second weekend, so he's now doing homework seven days a week. And my son, I can see him just sort of walking through the day, trying to keep his head above the rising waters. He's not getting ahead, he's just getting it done. And I've been noticing he stops really reading at breakfast. He's not bringing a book to breakfast. His eyes are red, and he's holding his head up at breakfast like this, and there's joy, uh, the joie de vivre, the, the, the uh, sort of passion that has infused my son around school and learning and ideas just seems to be kind of leaking out of him somehow. And I'm worried about my, my child. And into the fourth week this goes, and no let up in sight. It's now mid-November. And I've been realizing he's been leaving Spanish 3 for less. Now, he loves Spanish as a little guy. Look, I was making him take Spanish. I'm an African-American biracial person who all the Latinx people in Northern California think is one of them. So, tell the folks who speak Spanish, come to me and speak in Spanish. And I'm one of those, like, no hablo, you know. <laughs> and I, cause I took Spanish one, like, three times, but I never, you know, and so I'm rectifying that problem through my children, expecting both of them as Californians to learn Spanish. And they both started at seven and then eight and then Spanish two, ninth grade, now Spanish three with Sawyer. They've been leaving it for last. Loved it when he was younger, now he's dating it. So um, this particular night, the fourth week of this, it's 11.30 and he's still doing homework. And Dan and I are exhausted and we want to go to bed. But our philosophy is we stay up. 
to support because otherwise it feels like, oh, we're exhausted, but you stick with the kids because this is so important for your future. And um, so I'm fake doing dishes at the sink, meaning there are no more dishes to be done, but I'm just nearby being useful, you know, running the water. And my son is in the kitchen at the kitchen desk where we have a desktop computer, so his back is to me, I can see the screen over his shoulder. And as I look, I can see my son is doing Spanish lab, and um, he's not even doing it. What I mean is Google Translate is doing it for him. He's putting in the English, it's telling him the Spanish, he's writing it down. My kid, my kid is cheating. Now, when I tell this story to high schoolers, they say, that's not cheating, lady. And I say, fine, I'm not going to argue with you, but it's not learning. I'm pretty sure those little neural pathways are not realigning themselves with greater Spanish knowledge, you know. My kid is doing school, as my friend Denise Pope has written about in her book by the same name. Doing what he has to to get the right grade for tomorrow, okay? I run to my husband, what are we going to do? It's November of sophomore year, he's cheating, he's not learning any of that Spanish, goodness knows what's happening in the other classes. I mean, he looks like he's doing well, but now I'm kind of seeing behind the veil. We still have the rest of this semester to worry about. All of spring semester, sophomore year, the entirety of junior year to worry about, and half of senior year to care about. Right? Just half of senior year to care about. Do we need to let him drop a class? I ask my husband. I hope you know by now. I think you know by now. You know me well enough to know. There was nothing in me that contemplated my child dropping the class. No, no. My child? But I and my husband were worried enough about the change we were seeing in our kids that we decided we ought to ask him, but we decided I ought to be the one to ask him. So my now friend has come to kiss us goodnight as we were huddled together in the corner of the room, and he's gone upstairs to bed. So I go up there, and I knock on his door, and he says, come in. And he was in bed, and even though he was 15, he was still then sleeping in the Harry Potter loft his daddy built for him when he was a little boy. It's gray, there's room for the wand, and you know, the cloak and everything. I climb the steps to this loft, and I look down at my beautiful son, and I say, sweetheart, whew, Dad and I are so impressed with how hard you're working, and you are doing so well, but we just wonder if it might not be a bit too much, honey. You barely have time to read anymore. I'm not sure I know who you are if you don't have a book under your arm. Do you think you might need to drop a class? And Sawyer looks up at me into the first eyes he ever knew, mine. And he said, drop a class, Mom, can I? Don't y'all want me to do all of this? Don't I have to, Mom? Isn't it what'll make you proud? Well, you know me. I was thinking we bought this house here and you could go to this school and take all of these thoughts and that you very, very well. But I didn't say that. Instead, I look at Sawyer and I said, sweetheart, in some theoretical universe, we wanted to have access to all of these classes. But what matters more than any of that is you. And you're struggling. You might even be suffering. Do you think you might need to drop a class? And swear the eyes brightened halfway, brighter than I had seen in weeks, in a month. Just at being seen in a struggle to help. And he said, Mom, I'll think about it. So, well, he came down for breakfast the next day with a book under his arm, which I took as a good sign. And he said, Mom, I think I might need to drop a class. And I think it might need to be Spanish. <laughs> and I said, yes, son. I thought the Spanish might be part of the problem here. But by now I don't have the concierge anymore. Dropping it for him, handling it. Instead, you know, can you drop, how do you drop, what are the ramifications, and so on. But instead, I worked with him, role played a conversation where I pretended to be his guidance counselor and sort of could practice what he would say. So when the guidance counselor very predictably said, oh, Sawyer, you can't drop Spanish. Why? 
because the colleges want to see it. Sawyer said something like, you know, colleges want to see language proficiency, and I bet I won't end up impressing them with the D I'm probably going to pull off. And if I drop Spanish, I can focus on the honors chem that I love, and the algebra 2 trig, and the fancy English, and the fancy history, and the other class. Well, Sawyer dropped Spanish, and we got our son back. And I was working on writing a book for other people about how there are plenty of great colleges in the United States, most of which don't require a flawless, perfect childhood. I went from talking the talk for the benefit of other people that night to starting to walk the walk in my own house with my own kid. I accepted that night in just having a conversation with Sawyer that some of the so-called best colleges might not want him because he dropped Spanish, but that there would be other schools out there who would understand why and maybe even applaud it. Folks, why do we let U.S. News dictate how we raise our children? Why do we let that happen? Why do we let U.S. News ruin childhood? What I'm getting at is we let them dupe us into believing that there are 20 or 25 schools that matter. 20 or 25 schools, maybe 30, that we can be proud to send our offspring to. And if a child doesn't get into one of those schools in our community, we make them feel like losers. They can tell from the look on our faces that we think they're losers. Right? If their college list doesn't include the right schools, and we've asked them, as we ask all teenagers, the most inappropriately private questions, right? Where are you applying to college? Are you applying early? Are you taking the SAT? Are you taking the ACT? What's your college? Have you applied early? Are you going to apply? What are you going to go to? If the kid doesn't list the right college, they can tell from our faces. This is what we do to our friends' kids and to our kids' friends and to kids in general in our town. If they say the name of the right school, we go, oh! And if they say the name of a school that isn't one of whatever we think of as the right schools, we go, oh. Or, oh. Or, oh. And you just told that kid, I don't think very highly of you. I think you're a loser. I'm sad for you and your future. You want to know why our kids feel the way they do? This is one of the reasons. There are plenty of great schools in these United States, a country that does higher ed better than any other. We have 2,800 accredited four-year schools in this nation, and that means the top 5% equals 140 schools. You get a book of the colleges in America that contains 150 or 200, those are the top schools in America. You can be proud to send your kids to any of them. Not to say you have to go to a four-year school. Successful, happy people in this audience would prove the point that most people didn't go to a big brand name school to still lead successful, happy lives. You can go to community college in its own right and out into the working world. You can go to community college on route to a four-year school. You can go to a trade school. You don't have to go to college at all. But if a four-year school is what you and your offspring have in mind, there are 2,800. The top 5% are magnificent and they include large public and small liberal arts colleges. They're all over the country. They're huge, they're medium, they're tiny, they're urban, they're rural, they're suburban. They come in all different stripes, and most of them are not denying 90 to 95% of all applicants. When was the last time you beat those odds? When was the last time you went up against the 90 to 95% rejection rate? and managed to survive it, yet we've decided to set the norm in communities like mine and like yours. Malcolm Gladwell has produced or demonstrated in his book, David and Goliath, he's drawn upon other people's research about being the big fish in the small pond at college. He says it's better to go to a school one tier down from the best school you got into because you want to be in the top 10% at college rather than the bottom half or the bottom 80% at a more selective place. Why? Because the top 10% on every campus get access to what's truly great about a college experience faculty attention, 
when faculty have time and the inclination to mentor and teach undergraduates, that's when a student gets the very best that college has to offer. The biggest brand name universities, like the one I went to and worked at, and in ilk, often don't have great undergraduate teaching and mentoring because the faculty are very busy with their research and producing their scholarships, which universities exist for the purpose of doing, create and disseminate new knowledge. That's what a university is, which is important. We're grateful they do it. But it is hard in that environment to also be a faculty member who can make time beyond the research and the scholarship and the grad students to also teach and mentor the lowly little undergraduates but where does great teaching of undergraduates happen? Small liberal arts colleges, community college, the honors college, and a big public university, for example. There's a Gallup poll from five years ago that interviewed thousands of people about whether they were thriving in life across every measure from finances to happiness and everything in between. And they discovered that whether you went to a top 100 college or a bottom 100 college, now this is looking across the whole sphere of those thousands of colleges, didn't make a difference when it came to whether you said you were thriving. What did make a difference was whether you felt a faculty member had given a darn about you in college. That turns out to be highly correlated with thriving later in life. So faculty attention is the sweet spot when it comes for the holy grail, the secret sauce, when it comes to what makes a college experience great. Not the things U.S. News measures at all. But we don't know this because U.S. News doesn't report on this, or, and we believe U.S. News, or we believe our neighbor or our colleague or our relative who believes U.S. News, and pretty soon our entire work as moms and dads and people is based on, did I get us the right college bumper sticker? Right? You know college member sticker? Robin Hill, et cetera, related surrounding communities. You know the bumper sticker. You're picturing it right now. It makes you salivate the thought of the right bumper sticker on the back of your car to impress all the drivers behind you with how amazing you are. I mean, your kid is. Our entire sense of self these days is wrapped up in our kids. Parenting has become a performance. Our kids are just evidence of our achievement. Look at my child. Look at my masterpiece. You want to know what's harming our kids the most? Our needy ego. Our ego are so inextricably intertwined with our kids every moment. We are depriving them of the chance to just become a healthy, functioning human. We have to know at all times, how are you doing? Why are you doing better? Right? How have you done today? Was it better than yesterday? Like, there are stock in the stock market and we might just sell this one off. You know? Return on investment. Oh, we're an A student today. Oh, we're an A minus student today. We were an A student last week. What happened? Do we need tutoring? We are now getting A minuses. We are now getting A pluses. Oh no, what's wrong? We have to get our kids to the future we need them to have so we can feel good about ourselves and then brag about it, keeping up with the Joneses. We brag about it at Starbucks or Soul Cycle or on the golf course or at the bar or wherever it is we interact with the peers we're trying to keep up with and impress. And we are so busy in this parenting endeavor. We are on the soccer team after all. No, you're not on the soccer team. You just try running up and down the field a few times. And you'll know who's on the team and who's not on the team. Right? Oh, we were up all night with the glue gun. Why were you up all night with the glue gun? This was an assignment for your fifth grade. And there you are, up with the glue gun, right? And we keep tabs on other people's kids. So, or your kid, do they know where they're flying yet? Sophomore year? Right? Already thinking about college, where are they going to apply? Is anyone taking on a business yet? Oh no, they're taking their kid on business. We have to take our kid on business, you know? Oh, in my town, there's something called the super secret robotics team. There's the robotics team, and then there's the robotics team nobody's supposed to know about. Right? Just, right? Making future robots. And um, the sacrifice we make. Oh, we say to our childhood friend, oh, I can't go to that amazing art gallery opening with you tonight because we have a midterm tomorrow. You don't have a midterm 
It's your kids' bid term. It's their turn to take algebra, not yours. But we're doing all of this because we've decided we've got to get our kids to one of these colleges that U.S. News has said is the best, and because the flawlessness is required, we've got to be right alongside them over parenting. It's not just enough to be at the right school, no minor schools in this one, but not just at this school, the right classes at this school, getting the right grades in the right classes, making sure they're getting the right grades, tutoring, coaching, us sitting there night after night, make sure that the right grades are gotten. So when our kids, you know, doing their math, we're sort of looking over their shoulders like, oh, let me take a pencil. I mean, that's a nine out of seven. But teaching them the math is great. Just erasing what they did, putting in the right answer so they can get the right grade, that's cheating. All right? Or how about this? Oh, honey, read me your essay. Oh my, uh, let me give you some feedback. Here's a, try a better word. In fact, I have a better word. In fact, I have a better sentence. In fact, I have a better idea for this whole thing. Why don't you just, you know, share it with me on Google Docs, and I'll just take a look. You know, and, um, and then you want to call the teacher. Why did you give up on me? <laughs> and the science project, give me a break, right? You walk in and you see the actual replica of a volcano, and you're like, oh, I should have gotten a PhD in chemistry so I could do my child's homework. Right? So we do all of this uh, to help them. Everything has to be done perfectly. We've got to get them the right grade. Then there's a standardized test we can afford in communities like yours and mine to help our kids get the right scores on those tests. And those test scores are really a function of our ability to pay for test prep, to pay for our kids to retake the test. Everyone knows that, including the college board and all the colleges. It's not about innate intelligence about one's ability to prep for and retake the test. So we invest our money in that test prep and our kids' SAT and ACT, et cetera, scores go higher, and that's just the start in his childhood. In addition to the right grades and scores, it's supposed to have all the accolades and all the awards, and it's supposed to do all the sports and all the activities, and then there's the leadership they're supposed to do when a kid comes home from the first week of high school and says, Mom, Dad, I think I want to join the club, you know, some club that already exists. We say, oh, that sounds interesting, but how about you start a club, honey? Because colleges like to see that, you know? And then community service, check the box. Show the colleges you care about others, preferably very, very far away from home. Okay? And all of this is supposed to be done so perfectly, so of course we have to overpair it. We have to overprotect. Where are you, honey? I need to know where you are. Have you started your homework yet? Where are you? I'm down the hall, Dad. Just where I was. The Last time you asked, 20 minutes ago, we are fiercely directive. Oh, we're going to ignore that silly little thing that lights you up inside like art or theater or whatever it is and steer you toward the curriculum that we think opens all the doors to the future we need you to have so we can feel better about ourselves and we will be their concierge, handling it all for them, tracking their deadlines, bringing them their forgotten homework, sporting equipment, lunch, coats, arguing with teachers and principals and heads of school, and superintendents, and referees, and umpires, and coaches, and if the school has a portal, do you have a portal here? You do. I'm so sorry. Because I know some of you are addicted to refreshing that thing, right? What's it called? Power school? What? Genesis. I've been to places where people are in therapy because they're addicted to the equivalent of Genesis. Refresh, like refresh, 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 right? I need to know how we're doing today. I need to know. Tell me, Genesis, right? So we have to check the portal. We overhelp with the homework. Nobody here, but people near here, are doing their kids' homework. Okay? And we do all of this heavy work, or it appears to, right? If we're overprotective, for example, on a play date, if we're overprotective, you know, we intervene before the kids don't get along. Right? We make sure they're always happy and always taking turns, always getting along. We prevent them from having a hurt feeling. If we're next to them at the rock wall, in the playground, the plastic rock wall, if we're there to catch them so they don't fall off the rock wall onto the plastic wood chips, we prevent them from having a little bit of a bruised knee, right? We've prevented that good parenting. And if we've steered them toward a path to the future, that's the one we had in mind for them, they follow that path because our love is conditioned upon them following it, so they do follow it, then they're on a path, and there's no uncertainty. It's like, my kid knows what they're doing. Isn't that wonderful? It seems to be working. And if we're the concierge, we can get them a higher grade when we overhelp with the homework or outright argue with the teacher about it. We might get them more playing time on a better soccer team. If we argue with the coach, there are no bad consequences in this life because we're there to make sure nothing bad ever happens. Short-term win. This is why we do it. It appears to work. And if everyone else is doing their kids' homework, how can I not do my kids' homework? 
I can't send my kid in with their own homework. They'll be competing with everyone else's parents. <laughs> Here's the point. There's a long-term pause. They lack skills. They have never learned to plan things. They have never learned to handle situations. They have never learned to think for themselves, to cope with setbacks. They've probably not been permitted to dream their own dreams for themselves. They've never learned from mistakes because there have been none. Therefore, they have no muscle memory about how to cope with failure and strength, aka resilience about how to deal when things are tough in the future. Our constant <laughs> rescuing has taught them, hey kid, you're not capable of being successful. I need to be here and rescue you constantly. <laughs> this leads to a deprivation of self-efficacy. This sense we humans all must have of our own existence. Bear with me, this gets very existential. Rene Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. I know I exist because I'm a thinking, rational being. Self-efficacy is kind of the psychological equivalent. It is, I do, therefore I am. I know I exist because when I act, there's a result. And it's not about the result was amazing or mediocre. It doesn't matter. We need in our psyche to see the causation. Okay? We need that we know of our own existence when we see that our actions have outcomes, not our parents' actions on our behalf, but our own actions. When we overprotect, fiercely direct, or concierge our way to the kid's outcome, we're interrupting the natural development of self-efficacy, and that leads to higher rates of anxiety and depression. And when we assault our kids at the door with this question, Every single day when they come home from school or we come home from work or we see our offspring for the first time, we tend to say this. What happened on the science test? We know because we've looked at Genesis, right? <laughs> so we're not saying, what happened on the test? How'd it go? We're like, what happened? I thought we studied. Right? What happened on the math test? What happened on the science test? How much homework do you have? Have you started, have you started your home? When are we going to do your... When are we going to do your homework? Have you started your homework? Like the whole afternoon. Is this like nag, 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 nag. Like all that matters to me, kid, is your academic performance. Imagine for one moment you come home from a long day and whatever keeps you busy during the day and you've barely slung off your bag, your briefcase, whatever it is. You don't even have the beverage of your choice in your hand yet. And the people who ostensibly love you the most, your family, Says, how was that meeting today? Was it better than yesterday's meeting? Are you going to do better tomorrow? <laughs> Did you get that promotion yet? Why not? I thought we practiced. <laughs> Imagine. They feel they're worth more when their grades, scores, etc. light up our eyes. And they feel they're worth less or worthless when their performance isn't meeting our expectations every single time. And these questions we ask teenagers, I think, are so taboo. Right? We ask our kids' friends and our friends' kids, where you're flying, flying early, ATT or SAT, ooh. These are the most private things a teenager has going on to them, besides whatever relationships they might be having with each other, right? Like, there are taboo questions we're not supposed to ask our fellow adults, right? How much money do you make? Who'd you vote for? What's your religion? How's your sex life? We're not supposed to ask. And don't worry, I'm not going to ask. Okay? My point is, the equivalent for teenagers is the intricacies of their college process. We have to come up with better conversations to have with teenagers. We have become inept at talking to 14 through 18 year olds about their life. They loathe Thanksgiving. They loathe weddings and other family gatherings, because all the older sex seems to be able to ask is, where are you applying to college? And then, what are you going to major in? And then, what are you going to do with that? I don't even understand it, right? Woe be to the kid who's a nanotechnology major, and Grandpa's like, that sounds dumb. You know? <laughs> Thanks, Grandpa. Please pass the turkey. You know, we have to come in after talking to them, and we make them feel they only matter to us as a function of our 
values and ideals. We make our kids feel like little bonsai trees. You know the bonsai tree? It's a lovely little miniature replica of a real tree that grows in the wild. But we, the gardener, the parents, take our child, the bonsai tree, and plant it in the right pot, town, school. And we clip it here and prune it here so it grows more. And we grow it in this direction. We clip it and prune it according to our expectations. So we have this lovely little replica of a human, our child, and we can show it to everybody. Look at my child. Look what I have created. We make them feel like dogs in the Westminster Dog show, right? We're the trainer with a special little language to make the dog jump through the hoops and soar ever higher and good job, honey, right? Like we're raising best in breed and sometimes they feel like greyhound dogs in a little greyhound dog race, which we're not supposed to watch because it's illegal in most states, but um, the greyhound dogs, they're these lean little machines. This is our child, one of the dogs, in the right lane with the blinders on, going to run this race called Childhood. The blinders are our expectations and they're motivated by our continued questions and what the peers are doing. They follow this dirty little rabbit around the track with their classmates and they're in elementary school and middle school and junior high school and they're riding the race. And we're up in the stands in our houses with our fancy drinks, clinking our drinks with our friends. Look at them go! Look at her go! Look at my child here. Look at her how our team's working on, huh? for return on investment and they cross the line and finish this race called high school graduation. And whether they're first, yes, or a second, or a tenth, or halfway through the pack, or whether they're at the end dragging their bodies over the line, they all look up at us, the first eyes they do, with their own eyes pleading to know Am I good enough yet? Have I done enough to please you yet? Are you proud of me yet? This is how we make our children feel. Oh, I'm running out of time. I want to tell you about Sawyer. I'm just going to go for it. Okay. When it came time for Sawyer to apply to college, as I may have mentioned, he's uh, interested in a Nobel Prize. And um, <laughs> thanks to the internet, I found a list of where do PhDs get their start. And uh, as he's been saying throughout high school, I'm on a PhD in biology, specifically genetics. Well, on the internet, I found this list of the top 10 schools for the graduates who go on to get PhDs. And they are three large universities Caltech, MIT, University of Chicago, and seven small liberal arts colleges including Kalamazoo in Michigan, which I had never heard of, Oberlin in Ohio, Swarthmore in Pennsylvania, Grinnell in Iowa, Reed in Portland, and a couple others. So I take Sawyer to visit a lot of these schools, and he applies to a bunch of schools, and 13 schools he's applied to, and he does very well in his test, but remember, no sports activities, none of that, right? He gets rejected by six of the schools, because he drops Spanish. <laughs> for any number of other reasons, right? And, um, and he narrows it to four. But he won't decide. The four he's narrowed it to are Amherst, Northwestern, CU Boulder, Honors College, is the University of Colorado Boulder, and Reed in Portland. And um, I thought Reed was kind of a no-brainer because they didn't just admit him with a letter with confetti that spilled out into the kitchen. They sent him a book. Okay? It came with a book, the Iliad. And that's like saying to Sawyer George, just kind of hands, I see you, I want you, come here, kid. Right? They sent the book. So I thought it was obvious, but he wouldn't decide. Do you want to go on more visits, honey? No, Mom, Dad, I, I don't want to go on any more visits. Okay, honey, well, it's now late March. you got to decide by May 1, okay? You know, how about you make a matrix? We're trying to have a conversation with our son about the matrix. You know, you write down all the schools and the variables, and you kind of cross it off, and my son is falling asleep in the daytime as we're having the matrix conversation, and we're looking at each other like, what are we doing? When are we going to decide? He's got until May 1, and now it's early April, and he won't decide, and he doesn't even seem to be very interested in society. What are we going to do? And we say, Sawyer, it looks like you're really stuck. You can't make this decision. Maybe you need some therapy, honey. You don't remember Dr. Alper, who's just diagnosed you with your ADHD, why don't you reach out to Dr. Alpha? I've already reached out to Dr. Alpha. Would you be willing to meet with Sawyer? Absolutely. Sawyer, why don't you reach out to Dr. Alpha? We flies across town twice to meet Dr. Alpha at Starbucks, which we hoped would do the trick. On April 15th, he comes home from a date, 1 a.m. curfew. We have our best mother-son conversation late at night. Dan's asleep. I'm up late drinking wine. Sawyer comes home. And I'm drinking wine. We chit chat, the conversation is going great, and something in me shifts, and my son can tell I'm about to ask him about.
about college. And I didn't even said a word, and, but he can tell. And he goes, Mom, and he puts his hand on my shoulder. He says, Mom. And with this respectful gaze on his face, but serious, he says, Mom, I have a lot of anxiety about this process. And I said, oh, I know you do, honey. I know you do that, and I know. And if you just did the Matrix, in fact, in front of our popular act with the Matrix, you could have made a test for her. I look good for your grad school last Monday. Um, he said, Mom, I think that the root of my anxiety is you guys. And I'm thinking, not me. I read books telling other people what to do with their kids. Surely not me, son. And but I didn't say that. Instead, I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I never intended to make it harder. Let's go to sleep. Son, good night. I love you. All right. The next morning, I wrestled my husband away. You're not going to believe what Sawyer said. He said it's our fault. I'm pretty sure Sawyer was trying to say it was my fault, but you can be darn sure I was broken by my husband. <laughs> to our room and just sort of confront him with, we love you, we're sorry, and this is your decision to make about where to go to college, and we know you can make it, so we're going to just stop talking about it. And as any psychologist in the room would know, when we backed all of our energy off our son and made room for our son to show up in his own life. So on, on April 22nd now, the deadline of day one, I'm giving this talk in St. Louis. I have given this talk. I'm now back at my hotel watching news, and I get a text from my son. Time to talk. When have you ever had a text like that from your teenager? So I replied, yes. All oh, caps, yeah. yes. Dancing emoji lady, yes. And then my son uses this device for its originally intended purpose. He uses it as a telephone, and my phone starts to vibrate. And I answer, and he says, Mom, I decided to go to read. And I decided to go to read because every time I picture myself on a campus, it's read. And when I pulled down an angry just now that I was going to go there, I, I felt excited to telling them, and that tells me it's probably the right choice. And I'm really nervous about the junior qualifications, quals, and the senior thesis we all have to do there, but I'm pretty sure they're going to support me in being successful. And I said, Sawyer, you could have filled in that, fill in the blank. I'm going to go to with any college. And as long as you sound the way you do, confident, happy, sure, I would be thrilled for you. And we took Sawyer off to read in the fall of 2017, and that is where he is wrapping up his sophomore year right now, with a school full of 1,400 other students, a very small school, who all carry books in their hands all the time. <laughs> yes, the person you came to see tonight is still very much a work in progress. We think it's all about getting our kids to the right college and the right future when the longest longitudinal study of humans ever conducted said that the greatest predictor of professional success in life is whether a person did chores with each other or had a part-time job in high school. None of you, are some of you giving your kids chores? You should be applauding right now. <laughs> right, the rest of your brain, oh, right? It doesn't, it, uh, it's not full on, it's a vacuum. Just interested in 
sort of silly thing that happened at lunch and you really want to know what happened in math, button it. Say, tell me more about lunch. And pretty soon your teenage daughter is talking to you about some crazy thing they did at lunch today and your child and you were having a conversation like normal people and it feels really good. Like you, our children want to be seen for who they are, not treated like a dog we're betting on or trying to win best and breed for. They don't want to be made into the child you wish they would be. They want to be loved as they are. There are hundreds of great colleges. Some kids can do all of the stuff perfectly that the most highly selected colleges require, unscathed. But I'm here to tell you that many of them get to those colleges scathed. They are impacted by this childhood that leaves them restless and often feeling worthless and often lacking in self-efficacy. A wonderful adulthood awaits students who go to many, 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 many different colleges. If we just have the courage to widen our blinders and see more of them, we can restore a healthfulness to our family life and to our community. Working with other people's kids helped me better see and more authentically, unconditionally love my own. I am finally able to say I'm here to love them both hard and help them become who they are. You see, my incredible daughter is an artist, and I'm not ashamed to tell you that story of how I dismissed it all when she was tiny, because I'd rather someone in this room better be better able to see their own kids, because you heard a kernel of truth in my story and keep that story inside. And my son Sawyer wants a PhD in genetics, maybe even a big prize. But I realized I can't want it more than he does. And the truth is, he's worked at a summer camp the last many summers, where they say he's a natural, that he has a gift for working with kids and helping kids feel seen and accepted as they are. When can stop micromanaging? Stop obsessing. Stop acting like every little thing they do is make or break for their future. It's not just going to lessen their anxiety and sense of helplessness, but it also allows them to develop the skills they're going to need to have to thrive out there, to be able to make a plan, decide upon choices, cope with setbacks, fend for themselves, take care of their beings and their stuff, play well with others, pick themselves up when they fall, and keep going. And if we can pull back just slightly, it also gives us a break. Because let's face it, this over-parenting is stressing us out of our minds. If you're sitting there feeling, well, I can't back up because I need my kid to be a doctor, because I always like being in charge of every little aspect of my kid's life because I need to be needed because I don't know what I would do with myself if I stopped or I don't know how I would handle keeping up with the Joneses if I stopped trying to keep up with the Joneses, I'm going to offer this. Get yourself some help. I mean, like, get a life, and maybe your kid can have one too. Your partner is waiting. Your work, your hobbies, your friends, your aching self is waiting to feel life feeling good again. One of the reasons so many young adults in our communities are quote unquote failing to launch, I think, is because we've managed to make adults that look very unattractive. It's a humbling privilege to have been given these kids by God, by the universe, or however you believe we all got here, we can and must do better by them. Start with chores and love, and you know, maybe a little bit of therapy. Thank you very much. that I, I see 
you nodding, so I take it you agree yeah. with me, that's a natural extension. Yeah. How do you approach that with your kids or anyone you might have spoken with? Thank you, John. Any advice? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. In close to four years as the author of this book, I've never heard that question or heard it stated so thoughtfully. So we're in a rat race to get our kids into the right college, to get our kids to the right career. Right is always an air quotes, I mean, of course. To the right income, to the right house, to the right car, to the right vacation, etc. Um, this is a popularity contest. We are fragile, our egos are needing this, we delude ourselves into thinking that's a happy life. When, in fact, we all know so many people who have big houses and the best cars and have relationships that have fallen apart and have home lives that are not joyful, where no laughter is present, all the money in the world cannot buy you happiness or love or joy. And so this is sort of this false ideal. What we need is a restoration of our values as people, as men and women, as parents, as, uh, as people in a family unit, values-based approach to what is a meaningful, rewarding life, okay? Doing work that is the alignment or at the intersection of what you're good at and what you love is a sweet spot of work. If you're good at it and you don't love it, you just feel like a drone in your life, then you better be well paid so you can go on that expensive vacation and take your mind off your horrendous job for a week. And if you love it but you're not good at it, you're not going to rise, you're not going to be successful, likely not be able to pay your bills, who knows, right? So you're looking for that sweet spot. What are you good at and what do you love? This is why I ask my students both of those questions. Let me help you think through what's at the intersection. So my work life can sustain me and bring me a sense of meaning and purpose at the same time. So you know what really gets you ahead in life? We talked about chores and love. Sort of a derivation of love, how we treat others. Kindness is actually our superpower. And it is free, it doesn't require test prep, and you don't lose any sleep from being kind. You decide in every moment, will I be kind? or not. It's a switch you click on or off. A human who can move through our world, being kind to other humans, makes that person's life better. It makes the person who acted kindly feel better. And research shows anyone who watched that kind interaction happen is more inclined to behave kindly. That is actually one of the antidotes to the terrible morale we have gotten ourselves into where we feel alienated and angry and distrustful. We must all exit this place out into tomorrow, being kind and teaching our children that, and that will lead to a happy, rewarding life, and I would wager it is far more important than the brand of car you drive, the kind of vacation you take, or how many square feet your house is, or where it is located. Value. So, when we become the person who believes that, not just listen to some speaker like, oh, yeah, that sounds good, but some of you are like, yeah, 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 i got to go back out to my community tomorrow, lady. You know, and in my community, it all matters, the car and the bumper sticker. Okay, the back of my book, the last two chapters, are basically how to find the guts to parent differently. And the second to last chapter is uh, dare to be the parent you want to be. And, um, oh no, the second to last chapter is reclaim yourself. And then the final chapter, be the parent you want to be. And there's sample language for how to have difficult conversations with other parents, right? So when someone says to you, you know, your kid's 15 and sophomore year, says, oh, where's Johnny going to play to college, right? Because they need to know so they can get on it with their kid, right? You go, oh, we're not stressed about that in our house. And you smile and you believe it. And your friend's like, yeah, right. And you go, really? We know there are plenty of great schools. When the time comes, you know, there'll be plenty of great options. We've stopped obsessing about that. At this point, your friend's mouth will be gaping wide open. So into that open mouth, you spoon this little morsel. You say, oh, but I'd love it if she'd apply to St. Olaf. And your friend will be like, say what? St. <laughs> Olaf, that great smaller black college in Minnesota, or Carlton, their rival. Oh, I'd love it if they were up there. Carlton's one of the top producers of Rhodes Scholars. Your friend's going to be like, what? Rhodes Scholars? Carlton College? I would love for you to start to do some research on three colleges, quote unquote, no one has heard of, that you can get excited about. Great things are happening, and they're not impossible to get into. So you can start educating other people in your community. Okay? If a student is interested in athletics and academics, and you're thinking, Duke, 
you should also be thinking Syracuse, for example, you know, one school seemingly impossible to get into, one school much more reasonable to get into, both offering great academic and athletic opportunities. If your kid wants to do research and you're thinking, ooh, big brand name university, serious research, you should also be looking up these small liberal arts colleges I mentioned, Reed, Grinnell, Swarthmore, Oberlin, Kalamazoo, etc. Okay, there are lists, you can find these things. If a kid is interested in a place that has a strong, thriving alumni community that is prouder than proud and will help you, you know, all your life. You know, well, there's a famous school called USC, a little infamous, infamous these days with some of the things that have happened. Right? USC is known for that. You know who's also known for that? The historically black colleges, the military academy, and Suwannee, University of the South in Tennessee. Ain't no one prouder than a Suwannee alum. Most of you haven't heard of it, but Suwannee alumni will go to the ends of the earth for each other. Okay, there's just so much more information to be had if you're willing to look beyond US news. And sometimes the best option is an honors college at a big public, like the honors college at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. And you're thinking, Louisville? I mean, besides the sticky fried chicken and a good bagel of like what am I gonna get out of that? Right? One of the top producers of Fulbright Scholars, thank you very much, University of Louisville in Kentucky. My point in just dropping all of these school names, many of which you have heard, is widen your blinders, be willing to look at more schools. None of the places I mentioned are possible to get into. So it's values and more information that helps us be confident in saying, I'm not trying to keep up with the Joneses anymore. The Joneses are heading on a path to their own destruction. They may not realize it yet, but I'm going to be happy with my family with different bumper stickers on the back of my car if necessary. Because um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making a values-based approach to raising my children. Thank you, John. Next question. Come on down. This is the price of grace. Come on down. Go ahead, we'll go here and then we'll go there. Okay. Well, I just wanted to be selfish and steal some of your time today and go for a moment because I was so excited when I heard that you were coming to talk at Robinsville. I read your book last year and I'm somebody who has, I don't know, I guess I'm going nuts. So I had in my head for years that I wanted to raise a kid who was just happy. And how do I, how do I get that? How do I have a kid who can just be happy? Probably some of it is because I grew up very hard on myself. I was always trying to get the grades and it was strange. There were no parental, you know, they weren't the ones being crazy. It was me. And so, I, my kids are very young. I've still got plenty of time to screw them up. They're only two and four. So if <laughs> I'm not going to get it right. What's that? He's not going to get it right. Hopefully, hopefully. But, you know, it, it's somebody who already feels a bit out of sync with society in terms of already talking to people about, I just want my kids to be happy. Um, I read your book on a whim because I actually work in a field that I'm, I'm getting kids out of college and based on getting college grads. And I thought, oh, here's a book somebody recommended. Maybe it'll help me figure out how to turn some of the kids I'm getting out of school into adults for my job. What I ended up getting was like this talisman of a book that I'm so excited to have from here on out where the things that have been swirling in my, my head that have had, had no proof that they were good. I just wanted to say thank you. I feel like I now have something that I can take with me and say, oh my gosh, information that I can use and shove in someone's face like you said. I don't even have a question. I just want to appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I imagine Sarah. Sarah. I appreciate that, Sarah, very much. I imagine it's a lot of work to write a book. If you ever wonder why am I writing this? Ten years out. Say that you're me. I appreciate that. Let me add this. The um, notion that we just want our kids to be happy can actually feel like pressure. Um, when our kids know that, not your kids, Sarah, but other kids, when they hear, you know, oh, I just want you to be happy. If we act as if we are so concerned about their happiness, it can really put a lot of stress on them. Because it's like, well, what, what will make mom, you know, mom wants me to just be happy, so I have to be happy. You know, dad wants me to be happy, I have to be happy. Jennifer Senior has written about this in her book, All Work, No Fun, the paradox. All joy, no fun. All joy, no fun, the paradox of modern parenting. And she says, actually, you know, it, you, you just want, you, you know, Stop saying to kids, oh, I just want you to be happy. The, the better thing is to say, you know, I'm just here to support you in being you. You know, I'm here to feed you and shelter you and love the heck out of you, teach you a work ethic, chores, right? Um, and, and just to support you in being you. And, you know, whatever makes you happy is probably the distinction. Whatever makes you happy, go for it, kid. And um, as opposed to, like, I just want you to be happy. Sometimes I can feel like, you know, an ego need of ours. Um, but the general point is, is certainly much appreciated and yeah, well taken. Okay, next, your name. Hi, I'm Michelle.
done. Trombone, no? Michelle. Michelle. So I identify very much with what you said about wanting to place your child in a good school district and give them the opportunity of you know, taking rigorous classes. And um, I consider myself lucky because that intersection that you talked about, I'm a, an elementary school teacher. And I think I'm pretty good at it and I love it. And I go to work every day happy. My husband is also a very happy with his job. And we're highly educated people. And I feel like sometimes just being in this family, there's pressure because we have achieved a, a pretty, you know, successful life. When you had that epiphany and you went to your son's room and you said, maybe it's time for you to drop the class. And he says to you, no way. How am I going to compete? Like, you're lucky that your son said to you, thank you, Mom. But when they get to that point where they're so conditioned to, there's no way I'm going to drop a class. Yeah. There's no way I'm not going to go to AP Spanish. Yeah. Because now I'm looking at my peers and I cannot step back. And I think a lot of us are having, we're having the adult epiphany that maybe it's too much pressure, yeah. but now they can't pull back. Right. What would you have done? Right. If he said that to right. you, what can we do when yeah. we're dealing with kids like yeah. that? Yeah, thank you for that, Michelle. There are so many kids who are getting the message in the water, in the air, from their peers, from the community, not necessarily from a home, that you have to be in this, or you have to take these classes. You know, there are plenty of parents who will say to me, I'm doing, you know, I'm not sending these messages, and yet my kid still refuses. This is putting the pressure on themselves. The first thing that I want to say, with um, all due respect, is, Make sure you're examining your unintended, passive messages. You can go to college anywhere, honey, you say, but every mug in your house bears the name of your alma mater, okay? You can go to every college, oh, there are plenty of great colleges, but the only t-shirt you wear every weekend says, like, that college. Just ask yourself, what, am I, what message am I sending? See if you can't really augment the narrative in your house so that when you hear that some kid is going to whatever school, um, is going to Elon in North Carolina, you know, you go, oh wow, did you hear so and so kid's going to Elon, that's an amazing small college in, in North Carolina. Let your kid hear you say that out loud. In other words, start to prove to your kid beyond the rhetoric. You can go anywhere, plenty of great schools. See if they can see you actually getting excited. Oh, so and so is going here. Fantastic. I've heard great things about Indiana University. Oh, that's great. Northeastern? Oh, nobody better as preparing students for the workplace. Let's educate yourself. You know, come up with good things you can say about plenty of places so your kid starts to genuinely, genuinely believe the rhetoric that you're not concerned about the right college. Now, in terms of taking on the community, you have to say, you might look around, everyone who came tonight is probably not a huge part of the problem, right? These are the people who are like, I kind of get it, I'm kind of interested in this term. Look around, find your peers, make a pact. You know, we are going to really try to turn the conversation around in our neighborhood. And so you start to say to your own kids, some families that are obsessed with perfect grades and perfect scores, and they're crazy. We're not one of them. You have to sort of poke fun at it, okay, in order for your kid to believe it. Like, we're not that crazy. Some people are crazy. I would much rather you get a good night's sleep and have dinner with us than get a 4.0. Seriously, okay? You say that, and you start to say, they're crazy, we're not. And that starts to help. Now, your kid can't really hear the um, safety that you're offering until they know they need it. So um, one day Avery texted me, and Avery doesn't have ADHD, she's type A, very hard, she's got these days in advance with me, a dancer now, 20 hours a week, she's dancing, so she's very organized. In freshman year, she was an honors bio, and she texted me, Mom, uh, there was a piece of homework I didn't know about, and you know, I was given homework said, Mom, I didn't even know about it, it's due, and I, I, I didn't even know. And I work from home, and when I'm home, I'm there, and so I said, oh, Avery, I'm so sorry, sometimes that happens. You know, not overreacting, not what can I do to change it or fix it. Just sitting with her, as Renee Brown would advise, our guru of vulnerability, I can't take your pain away, but I can sit with you as you feel it. That's one of the most loving things you can do. And 15 minutes later, I got a text, Mom, I have a stomach ache. I don't feel 
very well all of a sudden. And I knew the two were related. And I didn't say these are related. I just said, oh, honey, I'm sorry to hear that. And she said, I'm on my way to the nurse. Will you come get me? I said, sure. The nurse called me, and as she has to say, I'm calling her from high school. This is not an emergency. I said, yeah, I know my daughter's there. She probably texted me. She wasn't supposed to, but I'm on my way. You know, and um, I picked up Avery and didn't say anything, just hugged her and brought her to the car and took her home and made, I said, how about some tea, honey? Hot tea is good for tummy. And let's have some tea. She said, okay, mom. And as she was sipping her tea, I said to the air, not to her eyes, but to the air, I said, Avery, you know, sometimes we can't get all our work done. Sometimes dad misses the deadline. Sometimes I miss the deadline. Sometimes I don't do things that, you know, the quality that I wish I could all the time. Sometimes it's just not possible. That's all I said. I was just trying to put in her airway this message that people are flawed, your parents in particular, you'll be fine, just like we are, you still love. Without looking her in the eye and trying to have a sentence like conversation that would make her flip out and whatnot. So she was able to hear it, I think, that she was struggling in that moment. Whereas the night before, if she discovered the homework at midnight, and, oh my gosh, I've got to do homework. If I had said, you know what, your sleep is more important to me, forget that homework, it's not going to get done. She would have said, you don't understand. I have to get this done. Everyone gets this done, right? She wouldn't have heard it that night. Um, she did happen to hear it the next day. And so to meet them where they are, to show up with that reassuring, we're imperfect, all of us are flawed, you're still loved message, in moments of struggle is, I think, key. They literally can't hear it until they need it. As a college dean, I would tell you, we told all the freshmen about tutoring, counseling, and a bunch of other resources. Most of them, it just flew right past them because they thought, I'm never going to need that. So we have to tell them anew when they are actually struggling. So that's my advice. Um, when, the, when your son, find, if they finally say, all right, I'm losing my wits end here. I can't, you know, I've fallen asleep during the day. I can't possibly get all this work done. That's when you say, I don't know why you're doing all of it to start with. It looked insanely human. I never did this much when I was a kid, you know, and I and I support you, but you know, how about you take a break? When they're when they're at their breaking point, they will be grateful for that lifeline that you're offering them, which is the offer that they can tone it down or pull it back or not be perfect that day. Next question, anyone? Yes, come on in. Your name. Hi, my name is Lisa. And I just wanted to let you know, uh, I thought what you said is a great presentation, and I, I have a story that kind of dovetails, I think, in what you're talking about. It's, it's rooted right here in Robbinsville. Robbinsville High School has a really great class called Career Exploration, and it's mainly, I would say, freshmen and sophomores. And I was getting invited to come speak to the class on a couple of occasions to talk about, you know, myself and my job and what I do and how I kind of got there, and I tried to make it interesting for them. So I try to talk about what I studied in school and how I kind of got to where I am. And part of my story is that I was in college and I was pre-med for a year and a half and I hated it and I wasn't doing well. So I changed my major and I became an English and Spanish self-major and I went on and I you know, have this other job, et cetera, now. And I went through this whole story and I've done this a couple times and the last time I told this story here at Robinsville High School, a really sad thing happened, which is that one of the kids raised their hand and said, and said to me, what did your parents say when you told them you didn't want to be pre-med anymore? And the kid was really upset. And I didn't have an answer for the kid. You know, my parents were fine about it. It was the 80s. They figured I'd get another job somewhere else. Um, <laughs> And I did. probably didn't even know where you were in college. My, <laughs> my father didn't want me to go to medical school because it cost too much money. So he was really fine about that. But, um, so I didn't. But I made something of myself otherwise. But the kid was really afraid. Yeah. And it was really heartbreaking for me. I was you know, happy that he felt comfortable enough to ask me that question. But I really didn't have a very good answer. So can I offer an answer? Yes, yeah, thank you. So um, I was often, of course, trying to coach students around having this conversation with their parents. And I do it in my community, too, with high schoolers. And this is the way, I think, to a parent's heart. None of us are trying to screw up our kids. We all love our kids, and we want the best for them. We've just decided, some of us, that we know what's best for them. And we really want them to do that. Or we need it. And our own ego needs it so badly, we're going to make them do it. So I encourage students to appeal.
appeal to, a, to, to say to parents, hey parents, um, could we set aside some time to talk to them? If that's going to freak a parent out, okay? In a good way. I mean, like, they're going to pay attention, right? Could we set aside some time to talk? You're signaling this is a serious conversation. When you sit down with the parent, you say, I want you to know I love you. No, really, freak them out. Um, I want you to know I love you, or, you know, I care about you. I know you care about me. I'd like to talk about your plans for me, and I'd like to talk about my plans for me. You go first. You know, and, and then they'll say, well, you know, we'd like to go to med school, or, or we don't care what you do as long as it's medicine or engineering, right? And um, <laughs> some of you, I know, <laughs> sore subject, right? And, um, and then the kids should say, okay, I understand that's what you want for me. Here's what I'm thinking I might like to do. And when the parent then starts to say, well, you know, that's just not practical, you don't make any money, blah, blah, then you turn the parent to be empathetic. You say, hey, did your parents let you do what you wanted? Oh, they did? That must have been great. You know, what was that like? Because I'm not having, you know, you had that. Could you offer me what grandma and grandpa offered you? They let you do what you wanted? Oh, your parents didn't let you do what you wanted? How did that feel? So many of us are in therapy trying to get out of a life our parents pushed us into, right? So there's a way for a parent to, be, to tap into a parent's own empathy for their own self as a child or a young adult who was forced down a path and that hurt, or allowed to do what they wanted to either remind them, to remind them of either whichever it is, ought to help them be better able to see their own child. Um, so that's, that's what I encourage. Um, also to say to parents in that conversation, you have raised me well. I have good values. I know how to work hard. I know what I want out of life. You know, the older I get, the more it's on me to decide what this life is. And I'd like your support. You know, dot, dot, dot. The older they get, they'll be able to say that even without your support, I'm pursuing this path anyway. To Michelle's point, I want to just add one other thing. Sometimes our kids can hear the wisdom from people other than us. So, when your kid is just held back on taking, quote unquote, the right classes, the right level, going to the right house, if you can invite someone to dinner who's a family member, who's cool and interesting, doing something interesting in life, but didn't have that path, and you tell a family member or friend in advance, I'm inviting you to dinner, and somewhere about 20 minutes in, very casually, I want you to be like, you know, when I was your age, I was a total screw up, and, you know, I thought I was, you know, most of my parents, you know, just let them tell their story. Again, this can't be the story of a, like, straight A student to name brand college to success. Like, it has to be the other path of which there are myriad. And let that person just demonstrate with their own delight at telling their own story, you know, a story that your kids will find fascinating. They'd never listen to it if it came from you, but they'll hear it from somewhere else. I was, I was very interested in Avery applying to Overland, which I think is an amazing school in Ohio. And I turn out to have mentioned Overland so often, she was like, stop, I'm not, I'm not even looking at this. I'm, you know, mom, stop. I was like, Avery, I've only mentioned this like 13 times. She said, stop. And I finally decided I need someone else to come to our house and talk about our place. And <laughs> fortunately, I caught myself what I was actually trying to do and didn't actually go that far. Um, but it does work when it's coming to things, not like trying to force your kid to go to a school, but rather to open your kid up to the myriad paths humans take out from high school to a successful, happy life. All right, let's put the slide up if we can. Uh, this is the How to Stay in Touch With Me slide that's about to come up, and um, it is, it's got, take a screenshot of it. Um, I probably have to like move to the side here. When it comes up, oh, there it is. Turn the lights off. Um, and uh, this is How to Stay in Touch With Me. Look how low tech this is. <laughs> okay, if you can turn these lights off so folks can screenshot this. This is my website, my Facebook, my Instagram and Twitter, um, and if we could get these lights down, you can see that. It's going to take one second. Okay. So, um, there are some things I want you to know that are on my website. Uh, at juliethegotheems.com, on that, on that home page, you're going to see 4321GO. For any of you willing to kind of make a change, you know, maybe tomorrow or Monday uh, or New Year's Day, whenever you're ready to turn things around. So four, um, four steps to teaching any kid any skill. And this is on the website, so you don't have to write this down. 
whatever the skill, first you do it for them, then you do it with them, then you watch them do it, then they can do it independently. Picture teaching a child to drive, you do it for them, they're in the car seat in the back, you do it with them, they're old enough to be in the passenger seat, you're narrating out loud about when you brake and when you put the gas on and when you turn and when you look. Step three, you watch them do it. You're in the passenger seat, they're in the driver's seat. You're still there to take the wheel if something bad happens. Step four, you're out of the car, listening to a speaker on a Wednesday night, your kid can drive the car. Okay? Four steps, any skill, using the stove, crossing the street, driving a car, putting their own stuff in their backpack. Okay, four. Three, three things you must stop doing tomorrow. Stop saying we. Can we get the lights back up now? Thank you. Stop saying we when you mean your kids. We're on the soccer team. No, you're not. We have a midterm. No, you don't. My son, my daughter, my child. Stop taking your experiences and acting like they're yours. Okay, get a life, right? Maybe your kid can have one too. That's that. Stop saying we. Number two, stop arguing with all the adults in their lives. Teachers, principals, educators, coaches, umpires, referees are under siege from well-meaning parents who have to question every single thing. Teach your kid to advocate for themselves with authority figures speaking respectfully. Stop saying we, stop arguing with everybody, and stop doing your kids' homework. Nobody here, people near here, are doing their kids' homework. <laughs> it's unethical, and kid, teachers don't know what kids know anymore, and worst of all, the kids' developing brain learns, my parents think I'm incompetent, they have to do my homework for me, okay? The only good thing that's coming out of parents doing their kids' homework is that more schools are saying, we're not going to send any homework home. And that's a good thing. Less homework going home is good for their mental health. So maybe that's a silver lining. All right, that's four, that's three. Two, the two things that matter most, chores and love, you already know that. And number one, the one-week cleanse. If you're the sort of parent who's got to check Genesis all the time, right? How are we doing? Are we up or are we down? Are we up or are we down? What happened to science test? How we study? You say to your kid, hey kid, I know I'm always on you about how school went today. And I bet that can make you feel that I think you don't care. So I have to always nag. But I know you do care. All of this is on the website with the script, okay? But I know you do care, kids. So for one week, I'm not going to ask, but I'm buttoning it. Every time tonight I button my lips, I told you what I was thinking, but didn't actually say out loud. I'm demonstrating that. Sometimes you have to shut up, button your lips, sit on your hands, okay? You say to your kid, for one week, I'm not going to ask. And don't you dare pick spring break, you know? <laughs> You're not going to ask. Instead, your kid's going to come home from school and you're going to say, Hi, sweetheart. So good to see you. How was your day? And you take an interest in whatever they say, no matter what. Okay? Do not ask for a week about how much homework, what homework, what happened on the test, when are they going to study. There's more laughter in the home. And boy, do we need that. Because parents and children are having loving, interesting interactions as humans. Instead of children feeling like dogs in a greyhound dog race called Child 4321 Go, that's the only website. I know that, like me, you are trying to do right by your child. It is time for bravery and guts. We have to stand up to the Joneses who are trying to ruin our kids' childhood, snatch childhood back from the jaws of hyperachievement, take them out of these cages of enrichment and restore healthfulness and wellness to childhood. It is within your power. The time is now. Thank you for having me. Traumatic Loss Coalition, and thank you, Julie, for sharing that love with us.